the sound is okay. Yeah, you've got it. Hello, Sergey. Hello, Anton. Hello, oh, fantastic. How are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? Can you? Great, thank you. Can you can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. At the moment, you can't see the class. You can probably just see, see myself. Yes, that's right. I'll introduce, you, I'll introduce you to the class just now. They can all see you very well. You're on the big screen here. So yes, um, good evening class. Uh, I haven't even uh, talked to the class tonight. Tonight we're going to have uh, Dr. Sergi Ivanov all the way direct to uh, America. He's actually at this, the University of the District of Columbia, uh, Washington DC. So it's really great to have Sergi with us tonight. So he's going to talk on a topic which is uh, going to be really interesting controversial I hope. Um, do any of you have an idea of what the topic is, by the way? Nope? <laughs> no? Special topic. Special topic, yeah, of course, yes. Uh, so yeah, the topic is innovation and the morality of innovation and the ethics of innovation. Right, now Dr. Sergei Ivanov um, is an associate professor of management at this university for, for a number of years. Um, I met him probably four or five years ago now. Uh, it was when we attended a conference in Malaysia. Uh, he was doing a, um, a presentation there, a, a keynote presentation, and so was I. And we since became friends, and then every year since then, he's doing guest lectures for me this time of, of the course. Uh, and he's also talking sometimes on the topic of hierarchy within organizations and I briefly talked to you about this before. So yes, tonight uh, Sergey will uh, talk to us about th this topic for about 30 minutes or so. We'll leave it open to the class. Um, we will let you guys ask questions and hopefully Sergey can come up with some, some good answers um, and maybe leave you with something that you can incorporate in your assignments which are due next week. Right. So, Sergey, yes, we've got about 18 students here tonight. Yeah. Uh, a few people couldn't make it, but yeah, the class is quite full. Just now, I'll turn the the screen around, and you can start talking to. Um, you can start with your presentation, and then after about 30 minutes, we can um, have the question and answers. By the way, what what is the time now there uh, in Washington D.C.? Oh, it must be. A, Insane. I think it's like 3.30 in the morning. I have no idea. So oh everybody goodness. is asleep in Washington right now. Except, <laughs> except you. That's right. Fantastic. Yeah, listen, thank you for, for, for doing it this time of, of, of the night at your place. Oh, it's is, is, right. it cold? is it very cold there now or, or what's the weather cold some, a few weeks ago? No, it's uh, summer. You should all visit and actually have a class right here in Washington. Uh, right. It's a cherry blossoms. It's great, guys. So come on okay. over. <laughs> okay, thanks. We'll take you up on that. Okay, so I'm going to turn you around, Sergey. And uh, let, let me uh, know if you can see the class. I'm just using my little MacBook Air. So. Yeah, that's great. Hello, everybody. Now I can finally see you. Now I believe it, actually. There is an audience out there, not just Dr. <laughs> Deval. Yeah. So I'll just turn it around a bit. Yeah, you can see some students. Oh, very good, excellent. Yeah, yeah all the way to to the at the back. Okay, good, fantastic. Okay, Sergey, we are basically ready, so you can you can go if you're ready. Thanks, mate. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, good. Uh, I don't know. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for listening. So what I thought, um, I truly respect Dr. Deval, and for about. 10 minutes and then open it up for questions. I'm not sure. Did you guys uh, receive all the articles that I sent you? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I posted it on Blackboard, so all I think five files are available for them to download, yes. Okay, I have about seven files now, but let me briefly, let me do some file sharing and see. Okay, can you see what's on my screen? 
Uh, uh, let's see. One no, second. Uh, we can just see you. How about right now? Yeah. Yes, we can see. Okay, so I posted the about seven articles, and I'll send uh, Dr. Devali link, and uh, you can talk about that. Some of those are go as far as uh, what the uh, some of the latest organizational theories are. Some of those are some of my talk regarding organizational with you. Sort of. Let's see if you. Can um, uh, the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So what I thought I'll do is I'll start with maybe six, seven slides, and then open it up for questions and introduce a little bit about myself and what I do here in Washington. I've been to Melbourne several times. Absolutely love it. So how is the weather there? <laughs> oh no. It's I'm afraid it, it, it's not as nice as there at your place. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's not too bad tonight, but it it rained a lot over the last few days. Oh, but no. it's not too bad now. Okay, well, my friend is visiting Melbourne. I think next week for a conference. I'll tell him it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. So anyway, so the topic is innovation ethics and uh, morality, and I came up with that uh, through uh, my work with organizations in the past about 15 years. Yes. So let's see if that. Would, um, hmm. So let me ask. Um, uh, uh, are you able to see our second slide? Yes, we do. Let me ask you a question. What is the difference in what actually is democracy versus fascism? Okay, let, let me just explain. He's not asking the question to me, but to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And if you answer it, then you don't have to do the papers for next week also. Uh, they will get A's. Yeah, is there anybody that want to have a go at this? Come on, you guys should know what democracy is at least. <laughs> it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I may be a little bit, I don't know, <laughs> out of it. But uh, let's start with those two questions. Yeah, anybody want to have a go? Merida? Oh, the democracy is going for a common goal, you know, like oh. when, or a common objective. Democracy, common objective is what we have had, common goals. Yeah. And where fascism is just like one way. Fascism just like one way, I yeah. Mean, um, it's very. Um, like, uh, yes. yes. Dictatorship, fascism. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Um, I mean, nowadays, I'm not sure what you guys are being shown in Australia. There is always a talk between different types of societies and uh, democracies, elections. At least that's what they show it uh, over here. Uh, I came over um, an interesting definition of um, both states, uh, and it was defined by. Uh, quite a famous psychoanalyst and scholar, Eric Fromm, and he defined both in 1941, and I tend to like his definitions. Uh, Eric Fromm defines democracy as a system that creates economic, political, uh, political and cultural conditions for the full development of the individual, differentiating it from fascism as a system that, uh, regardless under which name, makes the individual subordinate to extraneous purposes and weakens the development of uh, genuine individuality. Um, following, uh, and you're able to see all of the slides, right? Yes, yes. Okay, following those uh, interesting definitions between democracy and fascism, let me ask you a question about your organizational experiences. And looking at the class, most of you have had at least uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of uh, working in uh, modern organizational institutions. And uh, the question is, would you want for your children to have had similar organizational experiences as you have? Right. No. What do you have? No. Is there anybody that say yes? Those, um, so the majority of answers are, yeah, everybody says no. Why? But, but what would be your reasons? 
um, um, because of how bureaucratic system which uh, didn't let uh, new ideas come to action and they you know, suppress lots of new ideas and they have to listen to the boss or manager all the time. The way of running the business was or is the way Steve, the manager wants to run the business. Uh, could you hear that, Sergey? Yeah, that's a great answer. That's uh, uh, very good. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I would also ref uh, refer to um, how would your colleagues answer this question. So now my guess is uh, for most adults uh, you would find the similar answers that, and I don't know the person's name who just answered, but you would probably get about the same answer anywhere worldwide at least if you travel through modern uh, democracies. Let's see. Uh, another question that I uh, tend to ask is, if you won the lottery, uh, would you stay in your current organization? Armand, would you? Um, he's thinking about it. Yeah, maybe yes, yeah, but now let's throw a hand. How many of you would stay in your current organization if you won the lottery? I'll lift my hand because my boss might say it as well. <laughs> how, many, how, how many of you would leave the organization? Yeah, there's a few that didn't put up there. Yeah. Think of your colleagues. I assume all of you are working professionals. If your colleagues won the lottery, how many of them? Ninety percent. Ninety-nine percent. Somebody says. Ninety-nine. So you understand uh, the following the questions. Usually, I make a joke that uh, how many professors would walk out in the middle of the lecture? <laughs> <laughs> I know not your professor, but. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I love my students. I wouldn't do that. Right, no, you have a, a special yeah. one. So, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about my interest <coughs> and my bias. And I do, frankly, when I approach organizational work, and what I do is I uh, work either with organizations and conduct organizational studies, and that's where all of that information is coming from. And my bias is that I look towards... Um, I like original and scientific methods uh, to study people, organizations, and societies. And I, uh, I'm very much biased towards scientific that other people should have things and uh, have to be able to refute it in some fashion or another. I don't tend to subscribe to any current feds or something that's showing up in Harvard Business Review today, tomorrow, in uh, different uh, fashion states uh, of the field. Um, some of the uh, ideas that, uh, and I'm really grateful to um, your professor, uh, that I've been developing um, the following. Uh, fear are here. What I'm finding is that there is a staggering amount of fear in, uh, of fear in modern democracies. Uh, leaderless organizations, uh, types of uh, hierarchical organizations, and I've discovered uh, there are four different types of how managerial organizations work. Now, nested associations, uh, rapid diagnostics methods, uh, innovation in hierarchies, uh, defects in the organizations, crisis, uh, great shifts, uh, how to measure capability, uh, in ethics, uh, morality, that's a topic for today, but generally I'm interested in uh, general development of um, uh, civilization. Yeah. And so now what I'd like for you to do is uh, see if you have any uh, 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 questions. And uh, what I have here, and I'm trying to click on that, I have a little whiteboard. So if you have a question, I can draw an answer right here on, on, on the board. So I'll open it up for questions and see if we can uh, take our dialogue there. Are there any questions from the floor? So, Sergei, maybe I can start. Um, the the connection between innovation and, and morality, um, yeah, I can only vaguely think about 
possible connections, but what, what, what do you see as the main, the main connections between, between those two? Uh, very good. Let me reboot one of my whiteboards and uh, answer. <coughs> Now, one second. Guys, I, I just noticed my connections there. And uh, I noticed fruitcake sweetie. <laughs> I wonder who's that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. Just, uh, right, so. Sorry, Sergey. Oh, that's fine. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so let's uh, let's let's try to answer uh, answer Dr. Uh, and are you able to see the screen? Yes, we see a white the, the whiteboard. Whiteboard, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so let me show you. Let me draw it on the screen. Some of the latest discoveries, how uh, either organizations and uh, uh, human beings. What is the development of a full-grown, mature individual? And then I'll... Uh, so, about in about 80s, actually, I think in Melbourne, uh, there was a scholar working with uh, Rio Tinto, uh, one of the largest Australian mining companies. Yes, they, they are a lot in the news lately. Okay. Uh, and so that theory partly is coming out, out of Rio Tinto. And so they've discovered that... Um, it's in um, individuals and organizations ability to deal with complexity and if this uh, what he discovered is distinct levels of um, uh, uh, distinct levels of complexity as organizations uh, mature and develop so let me try to demonstrate um, first level oh, one second I will Okay, I, and uh, as I'm drawing out there, uh, you're able to see it, right? Yes. The different strings. So what he discovered is the distinct levels of capability, and that's one of the articles is. So, level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, and then I'll explain exactly what... Um, those on. Five, six, seven. It's, I think it's cutting off a little kind of your drawing? Okay. Are those numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or what supposed to be? 6, uh, 7, 8 and uh, I'll went into 9. Right. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, let me... Let me just... Okay. Let me just copy it. Okay, and so let me to explain you a little bit. So the way that an adult mature individual personality develops it through those distinct different levels. And those distinct different levels uh, operate as an ability of an individual to deal with complexity over time. So in, in an organization, um, let me uh, open up another page. Do you guys, um, how many of you work today, uh, currently employed? Okay. Uh, and so what you have is you have a boss at, at in an organization. Is it true? Yep, we would assume so, yes. And so you get different assignments. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, so the way that it works in, in an organization, so I'll draw those and I'll come back to the first slide. So what you have is you have an entity called uh, manager. And the managers assign different tasks. Whether well defined in your organization and, and or not, that's um, to you. Uh, so, uh, and you have subordinates. Uh, so you receive different tasks. Tasks have definitive completion times to achieve what uh, what by when. Uh, is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. And all of the defi all of the tasks have a def uh, definitive uh, 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 deadline when the tasks have to be completed. Um, let, let me let me give you an example. Um, does somebody is somebody currently working on something in an organization? Um, so yeah, some of the st uh, students are part of work during the day. Okay, so no, give me an example of a task. Uh, what what is the student working on? What you guys are full time, also part time. Yeah. I'm working on um, quality control. Of and awesome. how long would you have to complete a certain project within that? Um, Arman says he's working on a quality control project with China. And okay. how how long, let's say? Um, when is the project uh, supposed to be completed? Um, next week, I think. Next okay. Week. Uh, so, uh, all of the projects have a definitive timeline. How many of you also have families? Yep. yep. Okay, so for this one I'll put one week. That's yeah. it. For, uh, in your families, you have children? How far ahead do you look for? So that's, let's say, I'll split. This is corporate. And uh, this is family. How many kids do you have? I think, yeah, probably half the class have got families, yeah. And how far ahead do you look for uh, uh, for your children? Sorry, well, sorry. How, uh, how far ahead do you <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I mean, you plan twenty years. And what would uh, so you plan twenty years? And what were some of the things uh, that you look for? Um, that you're looking for? Um, uh, schooling, uh, support, um, teaching them uh, good behaviors, like. Um, <laughs> like diligence and uh, politeness and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. You, okay. you got that? Yes. Um, so I'll put it uh, actually interesting. My pen has run out. Let me go to the first slide. So you saw the differences. So what you find is majority of corporate tasks inside about one week, one month, get it done today, uh, two months, three months, maybe perhaps a year. Yes, with me? Uh, if you're looking at the family, you're looking at about 20 years, uh, schooling, uh, sporting events, and so on, uh, purchasing a house, uh, and uh, doing a long-term planning. Let me go back into the uh, first slide. So if you look at the corporate development, uh, what was found in the organiza in, uh, in organization is that um, organizations fundamentally function through diff distinct levels of complexity. And what differentiates different levels of complexities are the, inch, uh, the time bands. So level one between level two, uh, the distinction is about uh, three months, uh, one year, uh, two years, uh, five years, let me then explain. Ten years, um, twenty years, fifty years, a hundred years, and I call those roles. Um, I think one to two G 
and uh, this one three to four arjuns. So meaning that as you go to the highest, uh, the largest uh, super corporations in the world, generally the uh, organization should look at least for the next uh, or, uh, first or second generation of products and services. So, for example, if you're working at a company such as Apple, Boeing, Airbus, and the world's largest bodies, uh, the top roles have to look at about 50, 30, and 20 years uh, forward. Let's say levels um, yeah, 7, 6, and 8. Uh, let, um, what would be, for example, one of the most lo longest tasks at, let's say, a company Boeing? What would you think? R&D. R&D? And how long, let's say? What would be one of the longest, let's say? 20 years. And what would that be? Um, are, you, are you talking about a specific project? Like Correct. Designing a brand new type of passenger airliner or something like that? Okay, fair enough. Uh, can you do it in within about the next year or two? No. So for the world, um, uh, it's the same with Rio Tinto. The longest project should go into about 20 or 30 years ahead, such as discovering new mines and so on. <clears throat> and so what you find is that generally, I mean, um, people um, they like to work with complexities. At, uh, so when you look at the adult uh, development, uh, of, of a health individual, that's what Eric Fromm is referring to, and that's where innovation is coming from. Generally, that is the areas about um, five and above. It meaning that means that you can develop an idea long term into the future. Um, anything that you find, uh, let's say, that's worthwhile doing, everything takes a very long time. And generally, it takes five plus more year uh, uh, and more years. There is not no such thing as a short term, let's say, innovation um, or anything in the like. And that's um, so. When you look now at the modern corporate body, what at least I'm finding is that uh, if you look, uh, work in an organization, where do you think of where most uh, ed, um, um, most of the workforce work at which levels of, um, uh, at least on this chart? Three months to one year. Mm. Three months to one year, somewhere um, uh, right here. How did you know? Personal experience. <laughs> very, very, very. Um, and, and that's what I'm finding. If you go to world's most organization, that's where the majority of people are with some kind of um, uh, superstructures, understructures. And within this slab defect, what I'm finding is, and it was a serendipitous discovery, at is you produce defect. And no normal individual can function at uh, the very lowest level. So let me ask you, what's the level of work of a college professor? Like for your professor, it's it's um projects are typically six months. So within levels one and two. Yeah. Okay. I mean that's the that's the teaching part. The the research projects could could go one year, two years, perhaps. If you are lucky. Mm. So if you look at the most uh, universities, that's where most of the professors are. What you also find there were other discoveries around this uh, level, that uh, people who uh, only work at this level. Uh, you're not in the right uh, sort of uh, thinking mode to develop anything of substance or anything of value. Uh, now then, if you look at the development of a mature personality for people to function uh, well, uh, most of the people, even though your role is at the level one or two, 
most people tend to um, flourish well when they have to deal with complexities at somewhere at the levels uh, much higher when you are functioning. And there is always a dis incongruency and there is a conflict between the mature personality and the employment opportunities that is being provided to you. And in a way that, let's say, if your role is somewhere here and your capability is at a much higher level, there is an, um, uh, a, a great conflict within. And so if you look at a modern organization, um, and if you look at an innovation and uh, relating those together, for organizations to innovate, people really must uh, operate at a very high levels of work, lo uh, working on long-term projects. In fact, our organizations deny that very opportunity and become very systems that suppress adult uh, uh, development in, in, into the future. Uh, further, let me show you one. Um, the development of a mature personality, and I'll draw it in. Sorry, Sergey, can, can we maybe I'll stop here for a moment and sure. ask if there's any questions? Do, do you guys get it? The connection? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, was okay. at a, I was at a government department yesterday here in, in, um, in Melbourne, and, and they have a massive problem um, that uh, affects the whole functioning of that. Um, department. It's about to do with their systems and the process the way it works. It's um, you know, it's the Department of Planning, and, and they have a manual system which is held together by seventy five thousand pages, uh, eight thousand word documents, and fifteen thousand PDFs. That if there's a change in one of those, they have to be manually done. And if, if someone needs to find out a bit of information, they have to be manually searched because there's no system to, to do that. So all the people are tied up in the one one month to, to three months working on that sort of thing and everybody knows that the problem needs to be fixed but it's a five year sort of three to five year project but they're not doing anything about it because they just they just have their government department they're just focusing on the next you know, the next year um, the next three years because that's when the government is going to change so uh, but the corporates are the same corporates. it's a uh, yeah, it's a huge issue. Go ahead. Are there any more quest questions about what's a, what Sergey is suggesting here? Yeah, it's a huge... Uh, I mean, thank you very much for bringing this example. It's a huge problem, and the huge problem is, is that not only it puts an organization into a perpetual crisis mode, but not doing the high-level work at... at, at a, uh, doing low-level work doesn't do any goodness, so what you're doing is you're postponing the crisis, which will then... Um, everybody is going to meet it at some point late into the future. And if you look at it worldwide, any country go in, we're in exactly the same level 1 and 2 mode. Now, the way further discoveries are done at levels 1 and 2 is that if when people um, operate with a capability within those two levels, they cannot make uh, good moral decisions. I'll give you an example. An uh, example comes out, out of other scholars uh, coming right after World War II, and one of them, a uh, famous one, was Stanley Milgram. That his question was, how come when a psychopath is in charge of a, a large country, that other people tend to agree and do whatever that, that particular psychopath says? And his example was with the Nazi Germany, that Hitler said, do this, and everybody said, great idea, let's... Uh, get rid of, uh, I think, gypsies, Jews, and everybody else around that. Uh, and so his studies also show is that when people intellectually at levels one and two, they tend to not understand the great implications um, with uh, any decision making. So there's a lot more going in. If you go into the uh, Deming's work, I'm not sure how familiar you with uh, Edward Deming. Some people are, yeah, from the quality uh, side of things, yes. Well, uh, right, Deming is prohibited right now from, uh, is, is not being studied, I think, anywhere in the world, which is, uh, I, I think, sad. Yes, uh, people receiving the MBAs in management, they have never heard of Deming, I think it's, 
I think it's a crisis in and of itself. But what he's finding is fundamental uh, that organizations, uh, this has nothing to do with quality, uh, uh, but rather with leadership. And most organizations lack leadership. And what he, is, he, he finds is that when an organization only focuses short term, that those organizations tend to not uh, exist for a fundamental uh, for a long time. And his recommendation is let's focus into the future, let's focus into the long term. Uh, so any scholar that you look at, at least that I have looked at, finds that if an organization only focuses short term into the three months, into the one year in business and never looks into anything uh, three, two, uh, five, six, seven, and uh, upper years into the future, that organization is uh, not going to uh, last for uh, a long time or will experience a uh, uh, different crisis. Now, with innovation, what I'm finding uh, f uh, further that as human beings, we're fundamentally uh, innovative people. And if you look at the development of a mature personality, uh, let me just give you this chart and I can answer it for more questions. That uh, the people uh, in, in orange, so here is how the capability develops for a mature adult. And, um, so different people are in, a ve in, in very different uh, modes of capability. If we tend to develop with age, so if you are, for example, at age 20, uh, at this, uh, so this is 20, let's say, uh, 30, uh, 40, and so on. At every age, your capability grows. And so if you're stuck into the uh, very low level of work uh, in your employment organization, if there is no opportunity, and uh, you're, you're able to work at this level, there is a growing conflict between uh, you and this particular. And so what the um, topic uh, that I wanted to sort of bring it together, that unless an organization innovates and produces and allows people to innovate, uh, in fact, its, uh, it, its actions are immoral. And it's uh, unethical not to allow people to innovate because the whole nature of the human being is to innovate. So let me open it up for more questions. I don't know if I'm making any sense at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, do, what do you guys say about the, the immorality that he's talking about? Do, do, do you understand that? Can you see that? What? With, with a short, short time frame view or mode of operation, why is it necessarily immoral? Can you, can you tell us a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Uh, As opposed to the longer term view, why? What, what's, the, what's the real difference? The real difference is that um, if you are not able to walk into uh, long term, if you are not able to being, uh, walk towards your capability, it's uh, the fundamental organizational system, and uh, Aaron wrote about the banality of evil, puts you into the position in which you cannot develop your own personality and your own ability into the, uh, to the fullest. And, uh, and that is going to be immoral, is it? In my view, I think that is greatly immoral. Uh, so how many of you have children? About half. half, the, half. Uh, if you believe that I'm wrong, take them out of school and put them to work. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. The, go the government will not agree with you, and they'll have an issue with you as a parent. But as a, as a parent to a child, you're looking to a full growth and development of your child so that uh, he or she could achieve the best... Uh, they can, uh, we, we, in accordance with their talents, and develop their talents as a few, uh, and develop new talents and so on. So as a parent, you're looking to a full development of your child. You're not looking to suppress that uh, growth of the individual in people. Right. So, so, but as far as I can imagine, I think most adults that find themselves in jobs where they have short-term projects to work on, they don't necessarily ob object to it or find it, find it immoral. Um, maybe that doesn't allow them to operate at their fullest capability, like you say, but I think they feel done in, in the process, or uh, am I wrong? Do um, any of you feel, if you're working on short-term projects, that, that you are done in by your company? 
Oh, it's, 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 it's a great question, Anton. How do you go... Uh, find the... If you, well, to answer that question, find the most boring... If you're, if, you're, if you're excited with your job, find a boring job and try to do it. Uh, it's like a fish in a fish tank. If, uh, how many of you are bored on a job? Okay. Are you hinting to maybe being in a production environment where you just do repetitive work all day long, so it's very short? Well, well let's find out. Let, 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 let's ask, uh, this to, let's say, and, and, and yourself as well. How many of you are underemployed? Uh, not by the, like, in the, by the level of work. That you high level work that you are currently doing today. Let's find out how many of you are underemployed. There's a lot of people who are underpaid, but uh, yeah, there's a few <laughs> underemployed. <laughs> yeah, quite quite a few say yes, Sogi. Okay, well, uh, some of you are underpaid as well. If you're working at the lowest level of the organization, in fact, most of the people are underpaid, and uh, the opposite goes to the to the top. And how does it? Uh, well, how does it make you feel being underemployed and being aware of that fact? Because I work for money. Just the motivation is money. Motivation is money? Well, so, so are you willing to do anything for money, even if it's at the lower level? <laughs> as long as the money is good. Uh, not anything. But yeah, if someone needs money, probably it should work. It yeah. Should, yeah. Well, well, let me ask you, those of you with uh, uh, children, how do your children behave when they do something they uh, don't like? I mean, we, we, when you force them to do something they don't like, give them a job or something. Is that what you say? Yes. Yeah. Well, they either resist actively or passively. Okay. Um... But they still do the job. No, no. Okay. Well, if you look at the children, the reason that I'm bringing children into the equation, as adults, we all uh, tend to fake our emotions. Most of us have no idea what our real are. But if you look at the uh, uh, children, they exhibit uh, genuine and uh, genuine feelings. Um, and generally, uh, for the people who work for money, uh, your real emotion is that you're ex you're angry. You have a great amount of anger in you because you are wasting your life into doing something, investing into the cubicle that nobody needs and you know you can do other things. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the majority of you are angry. Uh, do an experiment with your children. Try to convince them to do something that they really dislike and do it for a long time. Hopefully. But somebody must do the jobs. No, I think he's right. There's a lot of people out there who are angry, you know, they're in a job where they don't, they're underappreciated, there's all this stuff happening outside in the world, you know, um, things can change quickly, you can start up a, a business, build a website for free in half a day, um, but they're in a job where they have to, you know, toe the corporate line and focus on a short-term project and know that it's not going to go anywhere or know that their boss is going to take the credit or you, you're, you're, and most of you are underemployed. In fact, you are doing something else. You start your family, you go to school, you do other projects, you start a business. I mean, pe that, that, that's why you're here. And so that it feels is the, the, the very real and underneath emotion. So let's say if this is the role and this is you and, and you're much better. Bigger things like jail, and that's where the majority of people are. And uh, and uh, Freud and Einstein debated this topic in, uh, uh, at the list. And if you look at the majority of population, and if you say that about, I'd say 70 to 90 percent of people are in this mode, and 90 and 70 percent of people are angry. figure uh, world, worldwide. Um, if you look at uh, and how peaceful is the world today? Yep. <laughs> People say not much. 
Okay, after the World War II, very peaceful. Right? Any place you go in the world, it's a uh, peace, prosperity, and uh, so uh, uh, order. Um, so, so there is a huge dilemma that faces our generation: is that we then are not able to uh, organize our affairs to to allow for a great majority of people to develop into uh, to develop their mature and uh, personality and, and, and work on something that perhaps uh, people are passionate about. So I think it's, it's a great challenge. Um, let me tell you, uh, so, um, yeah, any more questions? So am I making any sense? I'm not sure because it's really very early here. I have a question. Sure. Um, so uh, there's probably two there's two parts to it the first part is um I, I totally understand people working in large organizations reaching a point where they have probably mastered what they've been asked to do and there's no other opportunities to do more beyond that so people get frustrated get angry hide it what happens with people who are self-employed so doctors lawyers accountants people who go to university, graduate, start their own business, they would very quickly become masters of what they have to do. And they have nowhere to go and nothing else that they can do other than maybe clearly retrain. So how, what, how, how does it differ between individuals who are self-employed and people who are in large companies? Okay. So mm -hmm. that's the first question. And the second question I've got is, is this a modern problem because Life expectancy up until the 1950s was, for most people in the world, about 50, 55 years. And so for a very long time, people were lucky if they got 10 years or 15 years worth of work before, you know, and, and so they had to master it quickly and then, you know, they weren't long enough for it to actually matter. So is this a modern problem? So two questions, quite different, but related. Yeah, I, I wrote I wrote a question. Now, thank you for this great question. Now, my whiteboard uh, um, just uh, ran out of ink. Um, uh, I I think for self-employed uh, people, it's it's uh, I think it's a, th thank you for it's a great uh, terrific questions. For self-employed, it's uh, it could be, it could go either way. It really depends on you and people's opportunities. I mean, uh, every great innovation has only come out out of self-employed people. If you take a look at the I think Elon Musk. I mean, the Tesla cars, Hyperloop, and uh, uh, Steve Jobs, and anybody else were, frankly, uh, self-employed people. But uh, and that's where all the that's where innovation is really is coming from, isn't from from people who are in fact self-employed or at the very top of the organizations. So, but I think for self-employed, you also need to have. Uh, you, you need to be doing the business that you are doing, and uh, there are a lot of other factors. But I think it's a key factor is being in charge of your business to develop a new idea and to develop your full-grown, mature personality. Are you aware that uh, every single innovation has only come out of people who are sort of classified as being self-employed? Are you, about, are you about big companies though that, that, that have people within those companies that create something new, invent something new? Um. Uh, if you look at organizations, let's see. Um. or are you talking about big inventions like the Wright brothers had their own bicycle shop? And they developed power flight. Like that kind of like right. Any innovation. What you look at, if you look at the fundamental uh, laws of innovation. By the way, um, blame uh, your professor. He started me on that innovation. Uh, to look at and so when you look at an innovation, if you look at the modern hierarchy that innovation only comes out out of self-employed people. Let me uh, draw those self-employed. Um, let me change. 
I told you it would be controversial. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, companies don't like that, but I've never seen anybody who, uh, at, at any level, who's disagreed. Uh, and, uh, but if you find anything contradicting, please, uh, by all means, let me know. So if you look at this uh, organization, and I'm actually I'm drawing blind because the ink has this. So only people right here at the top uh, can innovate with a new idea. Innovation can absolutely not be able to come out out of the lower levels of the organization unless you have a very uh, different type of an organizational system which you need to design, which uh, the ideas of which uh, I, I hear. So if you're in charge of that organization, your very problem you are solving is how to enable other people within this uh, large conglomerate to come up with new ideas. But if you look at the uh, self-employed people, it's people who start great businesses, uh, uh, the person uh, who started uh, Virgin, uh, they're all at the top of the organization. So either they started as self-employed or the greatest authors they work independently, but it's people who don't have that management hierarchy above of them. Um, did, does it make any sense? Yeah. If you don't believe me, uh, usually the joke I tell people is, if you think that you can innovate in an organization, come up with a great, new, uh, great idea and give it to your boss, especially if, this, if it's disruptive. And let me know what happens uh, by tomorrow. Um, so I, I, I think I've answered your question about self-employed. I think being in that, uh, that that's uh, the, the very great key to innovation that exists because there is no limit and nobody limits you. Uh, the second question is, um, is this a modern phenomenon? Let's see. Um, it, it's a great question. I have no idea. I think our lifespans are very short and I mean all of us have been around only for the past 10, 20 years and the majority of people have not been around at all and are unaware of what's going on. So, um, I think it's a, it's an entire development of the human civilization and as a civilization where a very immature species with very short life, uh, lifespans. So I think the problem has existed in the past at least 200 years with an industrial age. And, uh, and I think for a healthy uh, development of the civilization, this problem must go away. And it's got to go away in such a way where people can actually develop a full mature personality into the highest uh, levels of work. And the findings, what you find is now only people who have developed their mature personalities into the very highest levels of work can actually resist uh, uh, unlawful orders. I'll give you an example. Uh, if uh, somebody gave you an order today to go on and kill a, few, uh, kill a few babies on your way to work, how many of you would resist such an order? A few what? Just a few babies. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> now, uh, what you find is 90% of people say they will absolutely never go along with that. When you actually conduct experiments, you find out that over 90% of people go along with any unlawful or unethical order and they just submit into that organizational state. And what you find, people who resist unethical orders within the organization society so also have developed their personality into that grand view where they can look at uh, different things. And that requires that what Eric Fromm said, that full development of a human personality. And uh, I think if you're a leader of your organization, you have a great responsibility to do, design such a system which enables that full growth of people within your organization. And it's also good for business because then they can operate at a much higher level. But it's also a challenge of today. So whether it existed, I don't know, in 15th century, I, would, I, I have no idea. But the problems... Um, Now, as, as they exist, the world has fundamentally changed in the past 200 years. Today, I mean, you're in Melbourne, I'm here in Washington, the planet has become, uh, in a way, one. 
we wear the same clothes, we generally look at the same news, we have the same types of food, we have uh, similar experiences, the world has changed. And so I think I'm not really sure what's happening uh, a long time into the past, but we need to look, take, take a look at uh, what is happening into the future. And in fact, we're only, uh, if, if we're looking into the next three months, filling out a form and we're taking that very narrow view, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, for, for the for the world to sort of go on in that particular mode for a long time. It's unsustainable, as you can take a look at the... Just turn on TV and there'll be a conflict tomorrow, uh, somewhere. Sergey, if I can ask you, um, you've explained sort of what, what the problem is, but what, what would you recommend that the organizations or companies do to, to get us out of, out of this problem situation and make people less angry at work? I mean, in a nutshell, what, what can they do? How, how should things change? Well, what should change? We have to harmonize the organization. And the solution is within us, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of it. The solution is there. It's very beneficial for the organization, if you're the CEO, that your comp. Let me ask you a question. If you're the CEO, would you like for your company to perform uh, at the highest level or at the lowest level? Presumably the highest level, yes. I mean, if you're, if uh, at least if it's your company and if you're self-employed, and uh, what you find today uh, that uh, you you've heard of Nikola Tesla. Mm. Uh, Nikola Tesla calculated how much energy we get out of coal. Anybody wants to guess? Yeah, so when you, when you get energy out of coal, how much energy is wasted versus how much is being actually used? Anybody wants to guess? Efficiency, yeah. 5%? Um, um, 20, 30%? 20, 30%? Well, well, actually, your professor was right, about 5 to 10%. So about 90% of the entire energy uh, out of coal is being wasted. If you look at an organization today, uh, it's about 90%, our organization produces about 80 to 90% of waste. And uh, it's in everyone's in, it's in the interest of the society and the CAO and everybody else to increase it a little bit. Um, Fre uh, Frederick Taylor, in his famous studies, I think a hundred years ago, just found that waste and double the performance of the company with less workforce and everybody benefited. So the solution is the, here. The only issue is, it's how do we, one of the solutions is using uh, scientific and uh, uh, scientific management in organizations. Now the issue is that whether we're going to be using it and when. And uh, the, the example that comes around of is, uh, and have you ever heard of Ignaz Samelweis? No. He was a doctor working, I believe it was in Austria, in Europe, uh, before the germ theory, working in two hospitals. And he found that uh, when women uh, gave birth at uh, hospital one, most of them would tend to die. And if they go to hospital two, and that was for wealthier women, they would tend to uh, live. And so he's, uh, he started working regarding... Uh, why would uh, women would die for, uh, giving birth in hospital one? And so generally in that city, uh, poor women, what they would try to do is they would try to give birth on the street because if they would get into the hospital, they would not survive. So his solution was um, he did a different experiments and he said that if doctors only wash their hands. And so when doctors wash their hands, they mortality rate went from, I think, 70% to 0.01%. And so his suggestion to the, uh, his colleagues was, uh, colleagues, let's wash our hands. Guess what happened to him? He was fired. He was fired. How did you know? I, I remember the story. I've heard it before. Yeah, he was fired. And then eventually he was fired and they put him into a mental institution where they beat him up and he died of... Uh, so the solution is here, and, and one of the solutions is uh, teaching, uh, is, is sort of relaxing our institution and teaching proper management methods. I think uh, not studying Deming 
and then leading organization is criminal today. I think uh, there was another theorist, uh, Elliot Jacks, not learning about the level. So when you take a management course, when this inst paradigm of, of fear, and if you teach the right stuff, you tend to get fired. So we need to sort of get out of that mode of fear and relax our organizations to allow proper management techniques and just study and just just do the right thing. So it's a willingness of people to uh, to confront, I think, uh, their own fears. And uh, so, um, so at least that's that's part of it. The second solution is certainly it's technological, which is coming about. And the world technologically, the world has changed, and I think it's uh, going to change in the next uh, in the 30 or 40 years, where we will live in a completely different technological society in which we live today, and we have to reevaluate our own uh, how organizations and societies work, and how people should work, and whether that nine to five day is really uh, useful for the society, or so we have to rethink the whole thing. But uh, at least I don't know how many of you are in management. Yeah, most most people would be in management here in this uh, Running organization. So if you're the CEO, if you're within the department, you can use good management uh, methods and cut down on waste and, uh, and and do the right things. And people tend to respond very well to that. Uh, instead of focusing on what's happening the next week, uh, assign a project that where we're going to be three years from today and have a productive, trustful conversation. I think people would love it and they'll open up to you. And, it will be an amazing experience, but on the country level, I think we need to fundamentally um, focus on different things. And the problems right now exist in education, whether you look at the, the high in, uh, universities, whether you look at the, uh, the teachers, uh, the high school and middle school education, the problems exist completely everywhere and until I think, and, and we're reaching the, the, sort of the, the time of para great paralysis. So, Sergey, would, would you say that there are companies that are getting it right now, currently? Uh, some that are leaders in, in using the right management techniques, would you say? I would agree with that, and they even, you're using half of the management techniques. I think the greatest management techniques that they use is the thing long term. And some of the people who focus long term would be, in fact, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. Uh, certainly it was uh, Microsoft under uh, Bill Gates, but it's definitely not under Steve Ballmer, and you can see the difference between the, the, so that, I don't really see that many, unless they serendipitously have, having gotten into that, uh, some of the companies that get into that mode uh, almost right away, who function is the battlefield military when they attacked on their homeland. And so that happened with uh, American troops. Uh, I'm not familiar with Australian troops, but uh, during World War One and World War Two, the same happened military during World War Two. That you appoint competent people at the top who could think, and uh, and people tend to focus into the um, far, uh, far far in ahead. And I think in peaceful times, organizations tend to. Find, instead of uh, finding the most competent peop person to put at the top to find, uh, to find somebody who is more um, soothing and suitable and is generally people who are not able to work at the far, higher level of, of complexity and if you get in the, at the top role the person who is working with a uh, very low level of capability it pushes down the entire organization as how you uh, we all end up in levels one and two. I mean, Swinburne would be a different institution today if Elon Musk took over it, would it not? Smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do we have any more questions for Sergey from the class? So are corporations the answer or are they the problem and we need to dismantle corporations? I don't think you need to dismantle it. I think you have to... Um, identify what the real issues are within the companies and recognize that working on three months projects in in a, in the scope of a very large organization the scope of a government doesn't do goodness to an organization and uh, I'm not sure if it was you it was another person who said that recognizing that it's a five-year problem 
and putting proper resources and allowing proper time to solve that those those types of issues i think it will harm, uh, partly harmonize those types of organizations and then certainly adding the right uh, organizational structure uh, focusing on leadership for example most organizations today uh, i mean we live in a world of insanity and we think that it's normal we focus on I don't know, stupid things like per annual performance evaluations. You guys have those annual ratings in Australia? Okay. Okay, well, that, that, that disease from us and more are coming. I mean, who, I mean, we focus on stupid and silly things. Is it obvious that performance evaluations are... Just think about, let's say, our lifespans are very short. I mean, we only live for very few years. When a person dies, let's say, when, when we leave this uh, planet, are you going to think what performance score you got? <laughs> I mean, you're going to think whether you have achieved great children, whether you published a book, whether you've achieved something, or if you developed a new idea, or if you did. I, nobody is going to think about that minutia in which we think that then the most organizations are focused in. Forms feeling, uh, I don't know, uh, and if you're in Australia, you do this time checking in, checking out. Everything that's non-essential. And then we fall into the great crisis. And I think just recognizing that and allowing ourselves not to be scared and just letting go and trusting people and just walk into those firm issues and uh, I think it will 50% will solve, heal at least 50% of all the problems. Okay. Good. Any more questions before we sign off? It's, it's been a quite soggy. We're keeping you awake a long time now. Oh, Don't I love it. I'm hoping that I'm <laughs> making sense at this. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you haven't yawned yet, so I think you're, you're, you're okay. Yeah, you look uh, all depressed to me, so I, I'm sorry. I, 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 didn't <laughs> mean to, uh, no, I think they're all contemplating the seriousness of the, of the issues that you, that you mentioned. So, yeah, the, the, uh, if I think of companies like 3M, where would you put them? Which one? Uh, 3M. It's a certainly a large multinational organization, level 5 and above. Uh, but exactly where 3M is, I'm not sure. I think for any company to function well multinationally, they need to be looking at functioning at least at level... Uh, level 5, it's about a $1 billion business, about $10 plus billion business. So they have to be functioning out there. What's the next set of products we're going to launch in the next 5 to 10 years? If nobody is working on those issues, I think we're in great trouble. And if you look at the uh, very many companies, and if you think that they are working long term, including Boeing, uh, you will find them extraordinarily depressed because they are looking into the third, uh, three months project where we can cut costs, uh, let uh, uh, which cheaper supplier we can find, and looking at those non-essential, stupid things. Um, and, and the world is not peaceful today. And, uh, uh, and I, I think in the context, I think in the United States is a much larger country, but at least in Australia, to get your house in order, I think it will help everybody. Not everybody uh, has to be employed in doing stupid things. Some people don't need to work at all, and everybody would be better off if those people never enter the workplace. And some people need to be given those right now I know everybody I mean I I'll give you an example I've met a person and uh, that uh, he was only interested in eating cookies okay that better be left on leading cookies than putting into the greater responsibility somewhere and some people need to be given that opportunity to develop and if a people develop tend to I think the majority of us are not um, sick we're, we're trying to create something good for somebody else and if you are able to develop your abilities to the fullest i think the larger society will benefit be it through uh, uh, creation of an organization where people can work leading people and doing something uh, great for the society and uh, uh, so how it's going to develop i'm not sure but i think the large part of that is going to be where the uh, technological innovation is going to come from and if we develop ourselves as human beings to deal with that technology and, and how to handle it, instead of, let's say, occupying different countries, whether we can harmonize an organization and do something else. 
Okay, uh, Sergey. I think on that note we will we will end the session. Uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of the class. Thank you very much for for the time for your interesting insights that you provided us with. Uh, cert most certainly a lot of um, controversial views, but certainly things that make us think. So um, I think when we finish off now, we will have a short discussion as well here in class and just touch on the things that you mentioned. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got some really good articles that you provided that we will provide to the class if they want to read up further on this. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And actually, nothing of it is controversial. I think what's controversial is the stuff that we normally talk on talk shows and TVs, which which next politician. But this stuff is really mainstream. What's controversial yeah. is just throwing bombs at the country. And yes. I'm not sure if I'm in the same mode, but every yeah. day that you wake up, you turn on uh, whatever the news channels and see, are we still around? Or there is a war that I have broke up someplace else. Maybe, uh, and I think it's absolutely crazy, and I think it's criminal living in the 21st century in living the world in this mess. And if you touch anywhere on the planet, uh, touch in Latin America, touch in uh, Russia, touch in Europe, touch in uh, almost every continent, perhaps are uh, sparing uh, New Zealand and Australia, that there is some kind of uh, violent conflict going on. In other words, the country is being. Uh, uh, being disintegrated from the inside. I think Somalia is a great place to visit, or Honduras, or uh, I, I think it's crazy, and I think it's time for us to somehow get out of... Uh, I think one of the uh, interesting scholars is Muhammad Yunus. I don't know if you've heard of... Uh, uh, with his uh, different uh, social business uh, corporation, a different view of the world, but it's time for us to sort of, instead of being that complying human being in this is level one and two filling out a time shit, we need to take a look at at globally what's going on and, uh, and there's got to be an, a better alternative for all of us mm. yes absolutely i think um, you are dead right some of these things that you that we talk about sound controversial but i, I guess that's the link with innovation we need to open our minds and yeah look at new ways and things that sound quite foreign to us and probably Give pay some attention to it and see if it if we can make a change. Yeah, well, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, once again, we appreciate the time of day that you that you spend with us. But, um, and um, yeah, we'll we'll let you go to. Are you going back to sleep now, or <laughs> I'm, do you I'm start the day? <laughs> I'll start the day, but have a great uh, Melbourne wine. It should cheer you up. I yeah, know, yeah. Mel Melbourne so, has some great wineries. I've been there. And before I forget, can are you still okay if, if students, if they've got any questions, if they can correspond with you on issues, if they like? Or? Absolutely. I would love your emails. It helps me. It helps me develop the ideas. I'm uh, actively trying to publish them, however slowly, and articles are coming out. And so any question, and if you're doing something interesting, we just completed a project with um, uh, your professor's colleague, Dr. Meritz, with the doctoral program. So I love Melbourne. I like Australia. So anything that you have and you can help me and if you find something that doesn't agree uh, please email me please tell me i'm okay. really hoping thank you. to thank you so much and uh yeah we'll try our best at some stage to get you here in melbourne it's i think it's overdue it would be great to have you here we would love it i love i love okay. australia it's an thank, amazing you. Amazing. <laughs> thank you so much uh, <laughs> bye bye thanks okay, anton so we'll catch up with you later thanks a lot man yeah, thank you. See you. Bye-bye.